This is On Shifting Ground. I'm Ray Suarez. Immediately after the Hamas attack on Israeli territory, many feared the entire Middle East would be engulfed in violence. Four months later, some of those dire predictions have come true. Israel continues to carry out massive retaliation in Gaza. Almost 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, according to the Hamas-led government there, with tens of thousands more injured or missing. And President Biden's unwavering support of Israel, and perhaps the mere presence of the U.S. in the region, has inflamed tensions with Iran. In January, Houthi militants attacked merchant vessels in the Red Sea, disrupting global shipping. In response, Biden approved strikes against the Iranian-backed rebels in Yemen. And on February 2nd, three American troops were killed in Jordan by suspected Iranian-backed groups, and Biden responded with retaliatory strikes in Iraq and Syria. There have been more than 160 attacks on U.S. military bases and assets in Syria, Iraq, and Jordan since October 7th, and it may be the clearest indication yet the United States isn't welcome. If governments in the Middle East and a growing number of Americans don't want the U.S. there, why is Joe Biden doubling down in the region? And where does the fighting go from here? Trita Parsi joins me now. He's a founder of the National Iranian American Council and executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Parsi's latest book, Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy, reveals the behind-the-scenes story to the nuclear deal with Iran. Welcome back to Unshifting Ground. Thank you so much for having me again. Well, it's been about four months since Hamas fighters breached the border between Gaza and Israel in a planned, coordinated attack on a variety of targets that killed and captured large numbers of civilians. Now, Israel hit back with tremendous force in the months since, killing many more. How would you describe the situation today as we begin this conversation, the state of the conflict? I think we are exactly where we shouldn't be in this conflict, which is that it is still continuing and it is escalating. If you compare to where we are today to October 7th or even 17th when the Israelis first went in, it's very clear now the conflict has spread. You have the attacks by the Houthis in the Red Sea, attacks against the United States by Iraqi and Syrian militias, potential escalation between Israel and Lebanon, We're seeing that the conflict is spreading and the Biden's administration's strategy of seeking to contain it has proven predictably to not be successful because in my view, their strategy has been flawed. My worry is that in a month from now, two months from now, if something doesn't change, we may see much more escalation than we've seen so far, meaning that it could actually drag the U.S. as a whole into a war. Well, you've got to admit the word ceasefire is now much more prominently featured in the American discourse around the Gaza-Israeli conflict. It took some time. It took enormous Palestinian losses in Gaza to get us here. But now does it also look like all the players involved are looking for a way out, looking for an exit door at this moment? I would say there's plenty of people in Israel that also at this point may want to look for a way out. I don't think that includes Prime Minister Netanyahu because Prime Minister Netanyahu knows very well that once there's a ceasefire or a prolonged ceasefire or an end to the war, it also ends his political career. The population in Israel by and large blame him for what happened on October 7th. It happened under his watch. They're tired of his leadership and his systematic effort to put his own interest ahead of the interest of the country as a whole. So we are unfortunately facing a situation in which even when it's become abundantly clear that this is not working for Israel, I mean, according to the Israelis themselves, they've only been able to take out roughly 20, 25% of Hamas targets. That's after more than a hundred years of fighting and a massive amount of civilian deaths. This is going much slower than they had hoped for and expected. When it comes to the top leadership of Hamas, they have not managed to get to a single one of them. When it comes to releasing the hostages, that only happened as a result of the ceasefire. Only one person has arguably been secured through fighting. And that's a a questionable case. We have now numerous cases of hostages getting killed by Israeli soldiers as well. So 
on all of those metrics, it's doing really badly. And I think there is a growing pressure inside Israel itself, particularly driven by the family members of these hostages who have clearly seen that the Israeli government's priority has been to attack Hamas, not to release the hostages. Which brings us back to Benjamin Netanyahu, because he's been against the creation of a Palestinian entity, call it what you will, a country, a a state, a, a federated area, whatever you want to call it, going back 30 years. Yeah, and I I think it's very important to recognize exactly what you said earlier on. He's always been against it. He ran on a platform against Rabin and Shapiro in 1996 against the central formula of the peace process, which was land for peace. And I think we have in Washington pretended otherwise because we didn't want to take that confrontation with Netanyahu or with the reality that there were plenty of Israelis who didn't want to have a Palestinian state. And I think we have to look at ourselves and ask ourselves from an American standpoint, how have we contributed to this? Because for so long, we've been treating as if the only real problem, the only obstacle to a peace and a Palestinian state is the Palestinians themselves, using formulations that the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And there's plenty of problems on the Palestinian side, but we have been shoving under the rug the reality And I do fear that, again, a lot of the impunity that we have provided Israel by this constant political protection of it at the UN, et cetera, has contributed to a situation in which it has just been easier and easier for Israel to move more and more to the right. It's not the only factor, but it's almost unique in the sense that a country can move in that direction and actually receive more support from the United States rather than less. Let's talk about the Houthis. They're an armed Yemeni faction fighting the central government in Sana'a, backed by Iran, targeted by the Saudi armed forces for years. They've used this moment to target shipping in a vital world waterway, the Red Sea, and been attacked in return by American and British forces. After last autumn's Hamas attack, the Houthi war disappeared from the headlines, at least in this part of the world. If you're a factory owner waiting for a shipment that's now taking the long, slow, expensive trip around the south coast of Africa, rather than taking the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, you've probably thought a lot about the Houthis in recent weeks, but maybe not much in the rest of the world. Is this a a sideshow, a big threat? What's the significance of the back and forth attacks that we're seeing now? The significance, in my view, is more in the way that it can actually spark a larger war than that the attacks by the Houthis actually have been that devastating to the global economy. It has had an impact. There's no doubt about it. It has caused some delays and some extra costs. There's been much more of an impact, of course, on the Israelis, in which their port in a lot has been largely crippled. But according to the president himself, the attacks against the Houthis have not worked yet they're going to continue. In fact, I think it's fair to say that the Houthi effort of blocking the Red Sea became more successful as a result of Biden targeting the Houthis. Because we went from a situation in which the Houthis were attacking ships to an open shooting war between the United States and the Houthis. If you are a shipping company, the risk of going into the Red Sea is actually greater today as a result of Biden's attacks. And in that sense, it has actually made the Houthi effort of blocking the Red Sea more effective. If it was a strategy in which this would be a short-term impact, but there was clear signs that within a week or two, the Houthis would no longer be able to do this, then I think that would be something. But that's not what we're looking at. The administration itself is saying that there's going to be a prolonged campaign that can go on for weeks and weeks. That's going to have a, if we're worried about the impact on the global economy, well, this is certainly contributing to that. And the reason why I think this is particularly problematic is because there was another far more likely to work option, and that was to actually push for a ceasefire. The demand of the Houthis, as well as the militias, has clearly been that they're doing this to pressure Israel to stop its bombing campaign in Gaza. If the United States had pursued that, I think there would have been a, you would have been in a much better situation right now and a far greater likelihood that shipping in the Red Sea would have resumed and attacks against U.S. troops and militias would have stopped. 
Let me just give you some numbers that I think are quite telling. Between January 2021, when Biden came in, and March 2023, roughly two years and two months of his presidency, there was a total of roughly 60 attacks by Iraqi and Syrian militias against the United States. Between October 17th and today, we have had roughly 170 attacks. In fact, during the six days in November of last year, when there was a ceasefire, November 24th through the 30th, there actually was zero attacks by Iraqi militias against US troops. It completely stopped. Houthi attacks, I could only count one occurring during that same period. So it dropped significantly. So during these last three months, four months, we have had more than three times or roughly three times the amount of attacks that we had over the course of two years. That is directly tied to the warfare in Gaza. So we have a clear evidence of what could work and what likely would work, but we didn't opt for that. Instead, we escalated in order to de-escalate, and not surprisingly, our escalation actually led to an escalation. Where does Iran fit in this currently forming puzzle, and where do we go from where we are? I mean, even the Houthis are clients and recipients of Iranian aid over the years as well. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. The Houthis have received a tremendous amount of support from the Iranians militarily. In particular, I don't think the financial connections are that strong since Iran doesn't have much money and is under sanctions, etc. I wouldn't call the Houthis a client, however. And in, in fact, most of them receive support, but the degree to which the Iranians control them, I think, in the Washington narrative is exaggerated and which you're seen as proxies with no agency of their own. And then it's also exaggerated in the Iranian narrative in which they declare them to be completely independent and Iran has no control whatsoever or has no responsibility whatsoever for what they're doing. Both of those narratives are wrong and exaggerated. The, the truth is more in the middle, but it's also varying from group to group. Hezbollah is much, much closer to Iran than any of these different groups. The, the links ideologically, financially, uh, militarily are much, much tighter. If, the, if Hezbollah had done one of these attacks, I think it would be much more, we would be on much more solid ground saying, mm, very unlikely that Hezbollah attacked a US base without Iran's knowledge or perhaps involvement. The Houthis, completely different story. They're openly defying Iran. They're even mocking Iran, saying that Iran is being weak and has not responded in the manner that it should to Israel's assassination of Iranian IRGC officials in Lebanon or in, in Syria, for instance. When it comes to the Iraqi militias, it's a little bit different between militia to militia, but somewhere in between, by and large, where the Hezbollah is and where the Houthis are, in which many of them do differ with Iran tactically on several different issues. The Iranians don't have the same control, certainly not after the assassination of Soleimani, who had managed to create a much tighter discipline amongst them. That seems to largely, um, by and large, be less than what it was before. And I think the US intelligence itself came out and with the conclusion that the Iranians, for instance, did not have control over what the Iraqi militia did when they attacked the US. And we've seen signs in which the Iranians have been put pressure on them to seize their attacks. But it doesn't change the larger reality. And the larger reality is Iran is playing a long game, building up these groups, which they can build up because these states are weak state in Yemen, a civil war, weak state in Lebanon in the 1980s, weak state in Iraq. Some of these states are weak because of US invasion. Certainly that is the case of Iraq. There would not be any Iraqi militias loyal to Iran or tied to Iran had it not been for the US invasion in the first place that destroyed the Iraqi state. But at the same time, by building these militias, they're also ensuring that these states remain weak. And weak states are bad for stability in the region as a whole. And as a result, it is contributing to the instability in the region, particularly if these militias are not under the control of Iran. Not that it would be good if they were, but it also pr provides other types of problems when they're not. And the longer game the Iranians are playing, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Israel, uh, and the United States is that they want the U.S. out of the region militarily. And they see Israel, of course, as a major uh, geopolitical rival. But the Iranian game is to play the long game and kind of harass the U.S. 
and raise the cost for the U.S. to stay in the region, but stop short of actually killing Americans in a manner that could drag the U.S. deeper into the region or a direct confrontation with the United States, which the Iranians do not want, cannot have, cannot afford, and certainly wouldn't have the support of their population if they did. So all in all, in my view, it's, it's painting a very bad and dangerous picture. And in the midst of all of this, we have to recognize that as long as the fighting in Gaza continues, it will fuel these attacks by these militias because that's exactly what we saw after October 17th when Israel went into Gaza. It is not clear from Israel's public pronouncements on the future of Gaza what they think the end game is. There are different ministers who said different things, some more extreme, some less so. There are statements from the United States that indicate a a desire to see the PA, the Palestinian Authority, involved in some future governance of Gaza. Uh, The Egyptians have recoiled in many ways from a direct enmeshment in this ongoing problem. But it is not clear at all what happens, even when the shooting stops, when somebody figures out, here's the formula, we're going to stop killing each other, there's going to be a pause. It is really not clear from anybody, from Gazans, from the United States, from Israel, what Gaza looks like a year from now, three years from now, six years from now. No, I think that's certainly right. And and again, that of course depends on what happens now. If there's continued warfare, if the Israelis actually go forward with some of the plans that they had put forward, which was to use part of the Gazan territory as a buffer zone, which means that they would not allow the Gazans to be there. It would be reenacting a a very hard version of the Israeli occupation of Gaza. If they go with some of the other proposals that Israeli officials have been put forward, such as essentially expelling two million Gazans, they would call it voluntary migration, and completely annexing the territory. Some Israeli officials are talking about that and they're singing songs about how they're gonna be settling in Gaza. I don't think that is going to happen. I think the pushback from the international community has been quite firm. I think that would be extremely costly for the United States as well. You can imagine the double standards that the US would rightfully be accused of, mindful of how it has rightfully opposed Russian annexation of Ukrainian territory, but then here would be endorsing Israeli annexation of Palestinian territory. But there is also an importance here of recognizing that as much as the question of what happens afterwards is very important, we cannot forget about the immense suffering that is happening in the now. That the most important step towards having any chance of making sure that there is somewhat of a potential bright future here is to end the fighting as soon as possible. What challenges remain during this political year for President Biden, but also beyond if he manages to retain office? Is this a problem that he or any Americans can really make much headway in solving? I think that's a great question. And I think let's assume that Biden gets reelected. I think the first thing we have to recognize is that America's global standing has suffered tremendously just in the last couple of months because of Gaza. It was actually, Biden had been quite successful in restoring the global standing. It was one of his objectives following Trump. He wanted to restore it. You know, he talked about America is back. And I think by and large, he had really succeeded. Much of that has been squandered away over Gaza. So we're going to have to go back to that original strategy. How do we bounce back from that? How do we rebuild that? That's going to be essential because America's ability to lead on the issues that truly matter to the United States, its convening power has suffered tremendously. And it needs to be rebuilt in order to be able to meet some of the future challenges. But I think beyond that, I hope that one of the conclusions will be that we have to recognize we are not the solution to the Middle East. The Middle East has a lot of very complex problems, but we tend to constantly think that we can fix it. And almost every time we try, unintentionally, we make it worse. I think we have to recognize that this is a region that needs to find its own balance. We can help with that. We cannot lead by that with that by definition, because it has to be a solution 
by the region, for the region. And I think our tendency has too, for too long been to get involved. And by that, we end up getting embroiled in the conflicts and we become part of the problem rather than part of the solution. It takes a radical rethink of our foreign policy not to think of ourselves as a solution because it's part of American exceptionalism to think that we are always the solution. I don't know how many decades of failed foreign policy in the Middle East we need to have before we realize that may simply not be the case, at least not in the Middle East. Shrita Parsi is executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Good to talk to you again. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to On Shifting Ground, produced in partnership with KQED, with funding from listeners like you. Today's episode was produced by Elise Minukian, Sienna Barnes, and Adam Ailey. It was mixed and mastered by Matteo Schimpf. Additional production and engineering were provided by Rob Spate. KQED's Jim Bennett is our technical supervisor. Jared Sport is our executive producer. Philip Yun is co-CEO of Commonwealth Club World Affairs. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ray Suarez. Thanks for listening.